or, you know, when will the suffering ever end? And the reality of the matter is, unless we master our thoughts, we will stay in a state of perpetual suffering. As the Buddhist saying goes, all life is suffering, yet suffering can be overcome. And to overcome suffering, we have to face that which suffers, the source of suffering. And uh, I've put together a, a, a short PowerPoint presentation, just uh, 12 pages long. And I'll bring you into the theoretical awareness of why we believe we suffer, even though the truth of us, the truth of us, our true self, the real self, that which God created cannot suffer. But let's, through understanding, shed light on, on the matter. Um, I'm just going to share this with you now. So, make the screen a little smaller. Get myself out of the way, which is no pun intended, but this is really the truth of the matter. So, happiness really is um, for the human being, for us in our human form and our human condition. Um, <clears throat> freedom from suffering is, is freedom from mental suffering. Um, so happiness is really freedom from suffering um, that the mind holds, that the thoughts which we believe and become ourself um, undergo. So let's um, move to the next page. So everything we do in this world, everything we search, every activity that we embark upon, whether it be a career or we're looking for a partner or we're going on a holiday, we buy a new car or a new home and start a family. Everything we do is because we search the world for a way in which we can escape suffering and find happiness. So everything we do is in the search for happiness. If we're truly honest as to why we even search for God or to know God is we, we want to end suffering and we want to experience eternal happiness or joy. So we want to be happy. We want to be free of suffering. And yet we all know that the experience we've had is not one that remains. So the closest we've ever come to a state of permanent happiness while we appear to be in human form is when we get to a place of peace of mind. Peace of mind, peace is always of mind. The body is not separated from our thoughts. Um, the, the body is a projection of thoughts. So the body cannot be at peace while the mind is struggling. Those of you that try and fall asleep at night and you cannot fall asleep, you'll notice that the body may be still, but the mind is still busy and therefore you cannot fall asleep. So suffering in our world is simply the absence of peace of mind. And, and this is what the saints or gurus call the experience of enlightenment, that which we, we think is so mystical and so elusive. We think is so, such a wow experience when in actual fact, it's just a very peaceful state, um, a state of continuous peace of mind, regardless of what seems to happen um, in and around us, in our individual worlds. Remember that there may be 7 billion of us, but in truth, there are 7 billion worlds happening. Every human being is ha having its own world, has its own world. So we keep suffering because we're, follow we we're stuck in the following illusionary beliefs, um, which we've internalized as the me or the my experience. You know, there's always I, if you're honest with yourself, what is the difference between you as a six-year-old and you and your current age is the conditions around you. What is the similarity? Who is the experiencer? And at the center, at the core of all experience is I. Now, that I has um, a double meaning. It can either be I as I think I, said, I am, which is really the ego idea, or the I, the true self that observes this whole experience. So the, the little individual I, the ego self, um, the ego I, experiences the myself, the me self, the me experience through judgments and prejudices. And this is based on our likes and dislikes, our hatred for something it could be quite intense, a dislike, uh, or someone or a place which we cannot let go of or make peace with because we have these predetermined ideas, what's good and bad, right or wrong, worthy or unworthy. And it's always in relationship to the idea of the image we have of ourselves. Everything that we judge is in relationship to the idea we have of ourselves. The other thing that keeps us suffering is our projections and our perceptions in four various forms. Obviously, the most obvious is guilt for having done or not having done something 
to or for someone. Um, we, make, we feel guilty because we've hurt someone or we promise to do something which we haven't done. Um, the opposite side of that coin is blame. Someone has done something to us for something or some place or an event um, for, or something that we've done to someone, okay, or not, or they haven't done something, they made a promise which they haven't kept, they broke a promise that they, they, they made to us, um, they've left us, we feel abandoned, and we blame. And this, this leads to resentment, which ultimately leads to anger and hatred or deep depression. Um, and then, of course, uh, from the me self, the me experience is a sense of pride, a sense of specialness, um, and always due to comparison, we feel special. If we're better than, um, being better or knowing more, or being better educated, having more money, being more famous, uh, better looking, uh, we feel special about something, or having achieved something, we worked very hard, we've compensated for not having, and we've worked very hard and achieved something, and now we, we're very proud of ourselves the little me self, the egotistical self, and then we have the sense of grandiosity, and the opposite side of that coin will be littleness or low self-worth, where we, in relationship to others, we feel envious because we do not have or haven't achieved as much, or we're not as good looking or not as famous, and so littleness, we feel little, um, and we feel low self-worth, um, always in relationship to how we would have liked to be viewed, you know, um, we have this internalized idea of specialness, even though we may be suffering from littleness or, or low self-worth. And we, we suffer because the world doesn't treat us in the way that we believe we deserve to be treated. And that, des that deserving is always because of a specialness idea attached to, to how. And always in a self-perpetuating cycle, of our preconceptions and our expectations, which keep us in a state of suffering, always due to a past experience. You know, we, we cannot, we won't suffer of a future event if we haven't had a past hurt. Um, and so always our preconceptions and expectations due to a past event lead to suffering in the following experiences. So worry and anxiety, we may have experienced pain in the past or suffering in the past due to someone having done something or we've done something wrong, we think we've done something wrong, and therefore we worry and we, we suffer anxiety for something that hasn't happened yet. So worry and anxiety is always fear-based because of a preconceived idea, um, future expectations appearing real, fear. And then, of course, hurt and pain, again, because we suffered in the past and we believe um, others are behaving in a certain way, or not behaving in a certain way, or they're behaving in a hurtful way, they're saying hurtful things, and then we feel like we have no control over them or the, ex or the, ex or the experience. So it could be a boss or someone in a position of power over us, or someone we love dearly and expect them to behave in a certain way, and they don't, or they, they, they behave in a way they promised they wouldn't, and we feel hurt again, and again it triggers the pain body or the pain mind, the pain idea. And so as a consequence to worry, anxiety, hurt, and pain, um, we suffer because we then feel sad or depressed. We feel sadness, deep sadness, you know, because it just doesn't seem to go away. We seem to, we cannot escape this continuous cycle of suffering. Just, you know, things happen in threes or fours, and we just can't seem to get, to get away from it. And uh, why is this happening to me? It's always a personalized experience. We personalize everything that happens even someone in traffic cuts us off, they're acting in the way they're acting because of the way they're acting. And immediately we personalize it. Why are they behaving that way, you know, towards us? Why are they saying hurtful things? Why are they saying racist things? A racist says racist things. Um, and yet we personalize it and think, what's wrong with me? Is it the color of my skin? Is it my gender? Is it, you know, sexism? Is it because I'm a woman? Is, why is this acting, you know, why are they acting this way? And we internalize it and we think there's something wrong with us or we're not good enough. Again, we believe that someone should be treating us in a way that we perceive ourselves to, to be how we'd like to be seen. And we get hurt and we feel sad when someone doesn't do that. And of course, then that builds up on resentment and bitterness because we cannot seem to escape the cycle of continuous suffering, which makes us resentful and bitter. So we then have a just reason. We get defensive 
and 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 it gives us good foundations to then be bitter and and resentful or it gives us enough infam, you know enough ammunition to become angry hateful and vengeful and then we justify the vengeance because we again cannot seem to escape the cycle of suffering from the from the people places things and events that make us feel angry or hateful excuse the typo places and events and then we ultimately feel hopelessness you know stay stuck in a, in a in a situation of suffering long enough and and it drives us into hopelessness we we want to give up we want to we want to die we want to escape this world we want to run away uh, we feel this is it we cannot find a way out uh, the situation i find myself in my body my education um, the situation um, predetermined by whatever experiences i've had i'm never going to get out of this and this is it i'm stuck into this so we don't surrender to the suffering we give in so be very aware that you're not surrendering to it but you're giving up you're giving in to a perpetual cycle of suffering and so we suffer because we are thus unhappy because we have placed our happiness in preconceived expectations that something someone or some event or even a place outside ourselves will make us happy and and we that they won't and so to escape this there I've, I've jotted down seven things that we can do to escape this and first and foremost is accept that suffering is what has brought us to the state of awareness um, that there must be a better way than this at the end of the day the course of miracles has come about because two individuals said there has to be a better way and when they were ready to receive a new way of seeing things when you really have given up all hope that you the individual the identity the self the ego self can find a way out of it you now surrender to what is and be grateful for this because this is what's brought you about to in the realization that you are stuck in a mental hell your world is a world that could be that could be equated with hell um, because of the perceived um, idea of the ego it wants to keep you suff in, in a state of suffering. So surrender to what is and let go of all preconceptions, beliefs and expectations of what the world should be like. The world is an imaginary place created simply by the fallen split off separate self mind. Um, and it has created this idea, this identity, this projection, this material projection, because it is in resistance of the truth of what it is. Your physicality is proof that you're in resistance to what God made. God made us in his image. His image is spirit. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in the spirit. I'm just quoting the Bible there. So, you know, surrender to the fact that happiness has to come from within. If you're honest with yourself, if we're honest with ourselves, we've always searched for happiness externally from people, places, things, and events external to ourselves through the acquisition of, through the experience of something outside ourselves. And know that forgiveness is the only thing that will ever set us free from the expectations that the past did not turn out the way we had hoped for. Unless we're able to forgive, because everything we forgive is past. If we're not able to forgive our past, we're not able to surrender to what is and let go of all preconceived ideas, perceptions, beliefs that have held us bound to the state of perpetual suffering. Know that forgiveness can only be done by us. Um, and, and until such time as we fully realize that there's nothing to forgive, the practice of the forgiveness is something that I urge you to continue. In truth, since this is illusion, however, the experience is very real, but the, since this is illusion, keep practicing until you're able to see through the illusion into the reality of what is the real world. Know that we, if we do not manage our thoughts, the, the ideas that are not ours, the only true thoughts we have are the thoughts we have with God. So if we do not manage our thoughts, the thoughts that just appear to happen, we'll be sitting quietly. The next thing is a thought that appears. And the next thing we're embroiled in, 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 in the story. And the next thing we're angry and vengeful and, and, and having a fight with an imaginary dragon in our mind. Um, if we do not manage the mind, the thought, mind is simply 
a cluster of thoughts that we've now identified as the self and our thoughts. If we do not manage these thoughts, we cannot get out of, out of a state of suffering. We'll never find peace. And ultimately, and this is the ultimate goal of the reason I've, I've created this presentation and why I'm talking to you, the ultimate goal is to find the source of our eternal peace and not look for something to replace or patch or cure um, the symptoms because suffering is a symptom and the cause is the separate mind that believes it can be separated and therefore can suffer always due to some form of comparison. If it was only one being, one self, with nothing to compare to, nothing outside itself, how could it suffer if all of it is all of what it is? So suffering comes because we've separated from our, our source. We need to understand that the root cause of unhappiness, suffering in other words, is because we have judged ourselves as separate from all that is. And we have not fully realized that the world we seem to see, our own individual world, merely reflects our separate selves, idea of what we are. The world we see, the universe we see, um, is an idea that we have about what we are. Um, of course, we do not remember having made the universe we see, the world we see. Yet, everything in this world we see, in the universe we see, has a time. And if it has a time, it means it can die. And if it can die, it's not from God. Because what God creates is eternal and therefore cannot come to an end. So unless we forgive completely, we remain in the trap of our suffering. Never realizing that as we judge the world, we also judge ourselves with the same intensity. Um, as the Bible says, as a man judges, so he is judged. And of course, we made the mistake to believe that God would judge us for our judging. Yet God cannot judge. God of unconditional love would not judge. Therefore, it is our separate identity, our separate self that sees a world outside ourselves, as separated from, separated from us, that judges. And for whatever we judge in the world, we will obviously judge because it's in ourself, whilst we wouldn't see it. Know that everything you judge outside yourself First, initially, the source of that judgment is the separate idea, the separate self identity. And so true forgiveness is what eventually leads us to forgetting our separate self illusionary worlds. And thus takes us to a place where we collectively remember the source, God, of our true self, the true I. Okay, we collectively as the one holy son of God who resides in heaven in a state of love Heaven is simply the state of love in the presence of our creator, God. And we can use another word uh, for God being consciousness. And we can never and never have and will ever be able to be separated from that which created us. There is nothing outside God. So the entire experience that we're having, our world, the entire universe, the, the entire universe of separate bodies, all of it that we can see and experience is, is happening inside that which created it. We just have an idea. So we're, we're the dreamer. We're, we have an idea where we've fallen asleep in essence and, and are dreaming a dream of a separate self. The, the, new, the, the, uh, the Old Testament, the Bible, the book of um, Genesis talks of Adam. And Adam falls in a deep sleep. And in this deep sleep, he dreams that God takes his rib where Eve is created and the story continues. And they have two sons and, and one kills the other and so forth and so forth. And nowhere in the Bible does it say Adam wakes up. And we make the mistake that the dream of him separating and Eve and, and the apple in the Garden of Eden and, and being chased away from the garden is God taking. This is not what happened. If you read the Bible again, you'll see that. Nowhere does it say he wakes up and God speaks to him. When, when God says to him, Adam, where are you? When God is searching for Adam, it is searching in his dream. He separated himself from God and believes that he can hide from God. So go back to the Bible if you're interested and go and read. And, and nowhere does it say Adam wakes up. So the separated self is having this experience of separation where it, it believes it can suffer. This experience is the experience of heaven. Okay. On earth. So the minute you start to realize that I cannot be separated from and never leave my source, I start to experience this world of separation in a heaven-like state. The awareness that I am the awareness 
as the only experience that exists in truth. Um, and we're now at bridge consciousness. In other words, this is the closest I, the separate self, becomes aware that I am not separate, that I am part of all that is. And I start to witness the world um, as awareness in the consciousness, which is God, God and consciousness, the same word. And so unless we forgive completely, we can never forget that there is nothing to forgive. Remember that to forgive is to forget. And what does that mean? That once you forgive an illusion, the illusion disappears, never to surface again, never to challenge you again, never to bring you into a state of suffering again. So everything that raises in your awareness that makes you suffer is really something to remind you that this is something created by you, by the separate self. And once you have forgiven that, it ceases to exist. Um, if you haven't forgiven even a childhood experience of suffering, it will return over and over in your life um, as the experience in order for you to learn to forgive it. So as a young child, if you felt betrayed perhaps by a parent or in your teenage years by a lover, you know, your first lover or girlfriend or boyfriend, and they left and left you abandoned, for the rest of your life, that pain will resurface in every experience you have, whether it be with your spouse, with your lover, with your, with your colleagues, the, per the experience of betrayal and abandonment will continually resurface simply because you haven't forgiven the initial experience of separation abandonment. Um, and until you forgive any one of those experiences, you forgive one of them and you forgive all of them. So practice with the current situation you're having. Forgive, forgive that now and all of them are forgiven and you will soon forget any idea of separation and you may remember the experience but the, re the experience will not come and trigger that pain body or the pain mind the pain body always in the feminine the pain mind always in the masculine so unless you completely forgive you'll remain suffering because it will keep coming up in your awareness and um, and why can we not forgive it's always because the initial the initial separation brought us in, in into a state of darkness where we had no idea what we were. And so the minute we called for help, we had a desire to know ourselves. So suffering always stems from the initial first thought we had, which is a desire for something. And so we suffer because our desire has not been met with. And something, some place, some event, someone would make us happy. We would remember so we fell asleep and completely forgot what we were completely forgot that we were a holy son of god in god forever in god forever in the state of bliss of god in the light of god so as we fell asleep and we dreamt the dream of darkness with nothing happening we fell asleep and we asked for help and and immediately we desired to return to happiness not that we even had memory of happiness but you know in darkness we were suffering and in darkness we wanted to get out of darkness to, to escape darkness and and that was our first initial thought the, the desire to to get rid of this state of i don't know where i am i'm in complete darkness i'm in nothing in nothing and of course then we have an expectation we immediately then started to conceive of what the, what the opposite of darkness would be and this has been our evolution 16.4 billion years since the big bang since light entered the dream of darkness, we have had an expectation of what would happen to us if we escaped our dream of darkness. So what would be that outcome? Some event, some thing, some one, you know, some thing, God, we, we then objectify and project an expectation of God will make us happy. If we know God, if we can see God, if we can see the angels, if we can see Jesus, if we meet Jesus, we will, we will stop suffering. And, and, and because, we simply do not understand that to truly see God, we have to get out of our illusion of separation, our, our idea that reality of the physical form. While we're in form, we cannot ex experience the formless. So while we're in form, there is no way that we'll truly experience God um, as the experience of God. And then, of course, what really keeps us in a perpetual cycle of suffering is our beliefs of what the world is, um, and how the world should behave and how, how the characters separated from myself should behave in relationship to the identity I have as the separate self me. And we remain unhappy and suffer because we haven't made peace with 
or forgiven all the experiences we have sought, okay, that have brought us <clears throat> the experiences that we've had. And yet if we're 100% honest with ourselves, and if you're 100% honest with yourself, completely honest with, you, with yourself, you'll realize that they have but brought us to a place of unhappiness precisely so that we could figure out where to stop searching and where to look so we could find that ever elusive happiness. And, and we now, and this is where that wonderful saying says, unless you go within, you go without. So what does it mean to go within? We have to find the source of our joy, of our happiness. And that source in our current awareness will be that self and not the identity self, but the self that is always there. And if you, if you just go quiet for a second and just become aware of the room you're in, of your body, of how you feel right now, you'll immediately become aware that there's something observing all of this, something observing the thought and something observing you observing. And, and with practice and in complete and total stillness, you'll experience the, what the Bible teaches us and, and be still and know I am God. However, because we're, you know, beware that we're always looking externally for happiness. It's not outside ourselves. Go into that awareness. And the minute you in that awareness, that true self, the self that is the I am, that observes the entire experience without any expectation, without any judgment of what is happening, unless you go there, you will not find happiness. We believe as human beings that happiness can be found in the six aspects of the physicality, the physical, financial, social, familial, vocational and mental aspects of our, our self. Those of you that are, are knowledge in, in the chakras will realize that there are the seven chakras starting on the base chakra physical. Um, second chakra, financial, social, familial, vocational, mental. And so these are the physical aspects of the human self. That's where we look for happiness. And we look for happiness in all six. You could have happiness in, in three of them and yet be unhappy. You could be financially secure, financially independent. You could have great physical health. You could have great family, great social respect, but not be happy in your career and feel like you're not contributing and be unhappy. Or you could have all five completely fulfilled, but unless you're at peace mentally, you're unhappy. So in order to be totally happy permanently, we would have to fulfill all seven aspects of the physical human self. And as you can imagine, that is almost impossible to imagine. And yet we spend a lifetime searching to acquire happiness in all six planes of the human experience and yet continue to suffer even if we have achieved success in all six. And, and we have an idea that people can because we, we watch programs like Billions and, and, and the billionaire seems to have everything. And yet if you watch closely, they're forever searching for more. The reason we suffer and remain unhappy is because the essence of the real I, the real self, remains missing from our awareness. And therefore, we will continue wanting more and more of what we think makes us happy, never feeling truly fulfilled, no matter how much success we, we achieve on all six planes, because that which truly fulfills us, the self, the awareness, the Holy Son of God, which I am, unless you're in that awareness, nothing you do will make you happy. Nothing you experience, nothing you buy, nothing you bring into yourself, will bring you happy because all of those have been made in substitute for the real experience of the true self. We have searched outside ourselves, looking for the self, that which makes us happy, hoping to find it in people, places, things, and events, hoping to fulfill it on, on, the, on the six planes of the, of, the, of the physical self. And we haven't. And so there has to be another way. There has to be another way that we can find happiness because anything we achieve on all six planes will come to pass. Um, and we have been told, and we know this, and we, we even want to believe it, that unless we, fight, we seek first the kingdom of heaven, all else will mean nothing. Um, and if we, if we first seek the kingdom of heaven, then all else will be given us. And unfortunately, very often we seek the kingdom searching for everything else. 
and this is where we try and bring you know um, illusions to to or truth to illusions which cannot happen um, we cannot experience heaven while we we are steeped and are hanging on to illusions you can either see the real world or you can see the illusionary world never the two shall cross um, they are kept separate simply because the illusionary world has separated from in idea and identity from what is true so achieve all uh, success on all six planes and guess what happens next you start to worry what happens when i die because even this will come to pass and therefore there has to be some being something beyond the physical realm that we can acquire or become aware of that will make us happy and i'm using concept and and because i'm in human form so I use the word acquire. So if it's the acquiring of the awareness of the self that I am, um, we'll get to a point where we no longer use concepts um, because the concept itself will, will, will prevent us from realizing the truth. We will get to a place, you will get to a place where the experience will be devoid of all, um, all concepts. And it's and it in itself be completely fulfilling and therefore end the search for anything outside yourself. Um, that awareness will completely fulfill you and will remain with you. And no matter what happens externally, it cannot affect the peace of the self, that uh, the, the, the peace found in the self. Know that this the experience each person is searching for is actually free from the very person searching for it. Um, I'll read that again. Know that the experience each person is searching for is actually free from the very person, the identity searching for it. The freedom experience of the person becomes the experience freed from the person, freed from the identity. Um, and that's worth celebrating. That is worth acknowledging and, and being grateful for. So there is something that will bring us into that incredible awareness of of eternal love, joy, and peace. We are ultimately the creator of all the experiences we think we're experiencing and not the experience of them. This is the mistake we've made. We've, we've mistakenly believed we're the experiencer of the experiences made by some external force outside our own control. And yet we are that which creates all that we have experienced in order to fully realize that all of us are a part of that which created all and none of us can ever be apart from that which created which is created as all so once we we start to realize that the eye is the common thread in all of us if i is the common thread in me and i is the common thread in you and in anyone else then that i being the common thread must be the truth of the experience it's the i that experiences the entire experience from our childhood to where we are now, anyone's life from their childhood to wherever they are. And therefore that I is that which observes it all. This is why we turn our searching to the mystical fields, because when we have searched the world and, and done all the self-help programs we can, and unless we, we follow a religious path that is steeped in the spiritual experience, even that objectified um, objectification of the experience of religion will miss the experiential awareness that comes through, through this, the experiential spiritual experience. I am spirit and the, therefore the experience has to be an ex, a spiritual experience. So none of the six planes will make us happy. And therefore we now start to search for something beyond the six planes of physical experience. So we search for a God, Nirvana, bliss. We have this idea of what enlightenment or awakening or inner peace should be. And that becomes our next search and beware that we do not objectify the experience itself because that in itself becomes a search that, that never ends. And because you're unaware of what that experience of the self really is, you may have it. Um, and, and, and not know that you've had it because if we do not know what we are, we will not realize in truth what we are actually looking for. And therefore, regardless of what you call your search, ultimately the goal of every search is to reach the end of suffering and achieve a permanent state of happiness. If you're unaware of what you are, you will not understand that you may have already experienced it. Know this, that you are that which you search for. 
if you could only be 100%, 100% and completely happy with the you that observes all experiences in the world of your mind that you think you see and experience as the world you live in without any judgment, without any expectation, with any preconceived idea of what it should be, could have been, you'll be happy because you'll simply observe it like watching a movie with a sound off, not, no idea what the plot is, never seen those actors before, just watching the screen, watching the colors unfold with no expectation you'd enjoy even the most horrific horror movie because you have no preconceived idea of what it should and shouldn't be. Switch the, switch the noise off, switch the noise off of the, of the separate identity, the separate self, switch the sound off and you'll just watch without any expectation and you'll just enjoy the moving pictures and you'll just enjoy the moving pictures of your life. No matter what happens, nothing will derail you. Nothing will remove you, can remove you from the truth of what you are. And so if we're going to attempt to reconnect with the awareness of the self, who is our true divine self, the self who is permanently aware of the awareness that it is, okay, we have to learn a new technique. We have to, we have to go searching in a new way and not just closing by in meditation, hoping that in, in the silence we become aware of the awareness because very often you may have already experienced this, but unless you're aware of what is being aware, you become unaware of what's aware. That's a bit of a play on words, but this is the awareness that is aware that I am. This is the awareness that resides in the consciousness we call God. Know that there's nothing we can do but align our will with the will that we return to full awareness of the I am. And this is the clue to the process. The clue is as we start, hopefully, this final search, this this direct path to connecting with the source of our happiness. Know that there's absolutely nothing you can do to achieve it other than be completely willing to be shown. That means surrender to what is. Let go of any desire for anything of this world. Not in fear. Please just let it go and just allow yourself to be exposed to it. And the minute you are fully willing to let go and fully willing to let go of any memory you've ever had of being you of the world or anything in it, if you're truly willing to let go of any idea you have of what this should be, and you truly surrender to thy will be done in the full knowing that God's grace, Holy Spirit, to use another word, God's grace, Holy Spirit, love does all the work. And know that we will experience it at the allotted time. Do not have a preconceived idea. It should take X amount of hours or minutes or days or weeks or 40 days or 40 nights. When you are fully willing to let go at that allotted time, when you're no longer hanging on to anything in this world, when you're fully let it, ready to let go, grace takes over and brings you into that awareness. And it may happen gently over a period of a lifetime, what may happen suddenly, as has happened with certain sages of old, Ramana Maharshi, for example, at the age of eight, when, when they had the experience of someone in his family dying and came face to face with his own immortality. He had that direct experience when he realized who the sufferer was and connected with the I am through total silence. Um, also the, the saint uh, Maharaji, or Papaji, Muji, um, Gangaji, will tell you that um, as they surrendered to what is, without any expectation of what should be, um, the awareness came through. A great teacher today, uh, Rupert Spira, a phenomenal teacher of, of the I am consciousness, will tell you that as he fully surrendered, the awareness came through. And, and when you let go of any crazy expectation that you ho had hoped for this world would be, simply was a, a a little error where we had a tiny mad idea of what it could be, should be, would make us happy. Um, the ego was born. Why was the ego born? Well, you cannot question the mind that created ego. So it was born because we had a tiny mad idea that we could exist outside that which created us, that there could be an alternative plane of existence to the plane where we experience bliss. And, and, and this is how we find ourselves in an, in an idea 
a set of circumstances preconceived of what we call the world or our life in this world and not realizing that that which observes the world and the life that you think you are is never left you and is always there simply waiting patiently for you to simply return your awareness to it it's nowhere to go it's simply returning the attention to the awareness and so what is the goal of of this meditation what is the goal of this exercise is to connect with the self the i the true i am okay the eternal source of happiness which we'll experience as a state of inner peace while we appear as a human attending a school of awareness okay which we have named planet earth that is the ultimate goal of of this exercise is just to reconnect with that which i am have always been will always be and as we reconnect and we unite and atone as one the atonement atone as one in that awareness of i holy spirit through the grace of god does the rest and returns us to that awareness and once every single separate identity self every single little dreamer connects with that i am the dream ceases to exist and as one we return to our source as the prodigal son and realize that our father has never forgiven us never forgotten us never never held anything against us and that it was only an idea that our father had never forgiven us it kept us away or could not forgive us that has kept us away from returning and then, and yet our father is only complete um, when we acknowledge the completeness in him not that god can be incomplete and so the meditation is simply this just um close your eyes take a deep breath and just sit back and relax as relaxed as you can be in whatever position you're sitting in and just be aware of your body be aware of where you sit the position that you sit in and just become quiet become still and as you breathe and just relax be aware of your breath be aware of your body be aware of the position of your feet be aware of the energy that travels through your body your breath the sounds in and around you be aware of the room you're sitting in just become aware of the awareness if you're aware of your body if you're aware of the room you are aware of that which is aware if i ask you to be aware of your feet right now you are aware of your feet that awareness of your feet is the awareness become awareness itself simply be aware of the awareness and all that the awareness holds in its awareness simply be the awareness the experience of this awareness is not the actuality of the awareness the experience is the effect of the awareness the awareness gives rise to the experience of awareness awareness is that which experiences the awareness so as you are aware of your breathing you're aware of my voice as long as i keep speaking you're aware of my voice you're aware of the the sounds in around you the the essence of the room you're sitting in the chair or the position that you're sitting in the body in the position that you're sitting in that which is aware of it is the awareness that awareness is the real you this is the i am and so you could say i am aware that i am the awareness this is the self that god created as his holy son this awareness that you're having of whatever you appear to be aware of is the exact same experience every other i true self is having of the experience in its awareness the surroundings may be different the room may be different the chair you're sitting on 
country you're in right now may seem to be different. But the awareness that is aware of whatever you're experiencing, that awareness is exactly the same. You are now aware. You are now aware that you are in truth that awareness. And that is worth celebrating. That is worth saying glory to God. And if you return to the room now and open your eyes, look at the screen again and you, you can see the video of my face. You are now aware of the screen of the PowerPoint presentation of me speaking on the screen. You are the awareness that observes both you watching and that which you watch. That whole experience is happening in you. The computer screen that you're watching, the eyes through which you watch, that which watches, that which is being watched, that which the experience is watched on, the room that you're watching in, all of this is I am the awareness that is aware that I am. I'll let you sit with that for a, for a minute or two. Welcome to being aware. Welcome to being awareness. I trust that this experience has brought you into a awareness which has always been there. And if you're totally honest with yourself, you realize that you've actually always been aware of this. The awareness has always been with you. You probably experienced it often as a child. You probably experienced it often when you were tired or sad or happy or sometimes doing nothing or driving on a long distance just lost in observing all of this and yet never aware that you are actually that which is aware i believe through this experience you have collapsed time i believe that through this experience we have put into this world, this illusion of ours, a massive collect, collapsing of time. As you become the awareness, as you become that which is aware, you become the avatar, which brings the light of the world into awareness. If you could spend the rest of your days staying aware of this awareness, regardless of what happens in and around you, and even if something does happen, return to this awareness. Do not get caught up in what's ever happened. Do not go back into judgment. Do not go back into beliefs and concepts. Do not go back into raising the, the memory of pain. Stay in the awareness. Offer the awareness to all those around you. And simply by being aware, not even having to say anything, you need do nothing. Simply remain aware and let the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit flow through you into the world that you're aware of and allow the healing to be done for you. There is nothing you need do, but remain aware. Bless you. I love you. Thank you for the, for the opportunity to share this with you. Go in peace, be blessed and um, have a most wonderful day and a wonderful evening, wonderful weekend and look forward to sharing with you again soon. Goodbye.